Let's go ahead and get started. It's so good to see you. So glad you're here. We have a few announcements to make uh, before we get started tonight. And you may have some that you need to add. And if you do, that will be fine. I had a text a few uh, minutes ago from uh, Amy Kerr. Uh, and she said that she would like to add Lake Reed to the prayer list. He is the son of Mike and Michelle Reed. Uh, Mike teaches at Bevel and Michelle teaches eighth grade at the middle school here in Hamilton. They called from school today and they had to take uh, him to the emergency room. They've discovered a brain bleed and are flying him to Children's in Birmingham. Lake is nine years old. So uh, let's pray for Lake Reed, nine years old. Uh, and uh, he was drooling out of the side of his mouth, and he could not use the arm on, on that side. So uh, some of you know Ross Reed, who's the city councilman. Uh, this is uh, Ross's little brother. So let's be praying for uh, the Reeds, and specifically uh, Lake. I want to continue to pray for uh, Christy White uh, as she... Uh, I believe I believe she may lack one treatment, um, and then uh, Judy's Judy Roberts' son and Christie's brother Van Roberts, he got a port put in Tuesday, and he start treatments soon. Uh, let's continue to remember Mike Hall, David's brother. Um, what's the latest on him, David? Okay, so he has an appointment um, a week from tomorrow at Mayo, Mayo uh, Clinic in Florida. So, please continue, remember those uh, suffering from COVID, especially those from our congregation here. Angela Ray continues to have health problems. Uh, Sue Hollis is uh, better. She's still in the local hospital. James Dodd has started a new uh, type of treatment. Uh, Ethan Schatz, this is Linda Quinn's great-grandson. He's been in a physical therapy hospital in Colorado, and he has returned home uh, from the hospital. Uh, Bunk Hughes, this is uh, Patrick Crow's father-in-law. He's having health problems. And Harold Jones, Andy and Tracy's dad, is very sick at this time. Amanda Gober, uh, Doug Gober's daughter, is in the Florence Hospital with blood sugar problems. Uh, John Calvert, this is Shelby Allison's uh, uh, niece's husband, is in Vanderbilt Hospital. He's had a kidney transplant, and his body's trying to reject the kidney. Uh, Lisa Stidham is really sick with COVID. Dr. Kerr is back at the nursing home. He had been in the hospital, but he's back at the nursing home. Denise Crow has been having some health problems, and we want to pray for her. Uh, Frank Burrell is going to be having some very important tests in the morning. If you will, please be remembering him. And Brother Mark Posey, uh, the preacher for the Winfield Church of Christ, is supposed to go the, to Ukraine uh, next week on a mission trip. Uh, he's supposed to leave Monday, but right now, uh, he won't find out until Sunday whether he can go on that trip because uh, might be dangerous. Uh, anyone we need to add to our prayer list before we look at uh, some sympathy notes? Uh, anyone else we need to add to the prayer list? Well, uh, I'm sure that you are aware of these, uh, but we need to I acknowledge them and pray. Um, we express our love and sympathy to Sandra Ridings and her family due to the passing of her mother, Ruby Nell Cochran. The visitation will be Thursday from 3 to 4 at the Community Church in Hackleburg with a 4 o'clock funeral service. We express our love and sympathy to the J.L. Davis family. J.L. is a longtime member here. He passed away on Monday, January the 24th. 
The visitation will be Friday, January 28th, from 1 till 2 at the Hamilton Funeral Home. The funeral service will be at 2 p.m. We also express our love and sympathy to Dan Crace and his family on the loss of his daughter, Caroline. Visitation will be from 6 to 8 Thursday in Westwood, Kentucky, and the funeral service will be Friday at 1 p.m. And uh, Brother Dan uh, plans to attend uh, Caroline's uh, funeral service. Please also remember that Men's Day is this Saturday at Winfield. The program starts at 9.30 and continues until noon. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? I've asked Brother Will White, if he will, to come and lead us in prayer. And so, uh, Brother Will, if you will, come at this time and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you. We are grateful that you have given us this day, this opportunity we have to come out and study from your word. We thank you, Father, for all the many wonderful blessings in life that you have given to us. Father, you have been so abundant in your blessings toward us, and we are thankful and we are grateful. Father, we come before you now asking in prayer for the ones uh, that have been made mention, the one that Brother Ted mentioned, uh, Lake Reed. We pray, Father, that you'll bless him and bless his family, and bless the uh, doctors and the nurses that are waiting on him at this time as they figure out what all is going on. We pray, Father, that you will bless him and his health and uh, that you will be with the family and give them comfort and strength in their time of need. Father, we continue to pray for ones like Christy White and Van Roberts and Mike Hall and so many more that, that, that we are thinking of at this time that, uh, need your, that need your hand, that need your touch, that need your, your comfort and your healing. Father, we pray for the ones that are continuing to struggle in, uh, with the, uh, the virus, the COVID virus. We pray, Father, that, that you'll be with the ones that are uh, currently struggling with that ailment. We know, Father, many that are in the hospital and many that are, are not doing well continually uh, with that. We pray, Father, that you'll bless them and, and help them through their struggles and help them through their time. Father, we pray for the ones that have lost family members uh, recently. We ask, Father, that you provide the comfort that, that only you can provide and the strength that only you can give. And we pray, Father, that if there's anything that we can say or do to, to add a, a level of comfort, that you allow us to, to be that blessing to their lives. Father, we pray for Brother Posey and the uh, mission work in the Ukraine. We know, Father, that it's a very dangerous time over there. We know there's, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of uh, issues that are happening in that part of the world. And we pray, Father, for not only him, if he's able to go for his safe travels. Father, we pray for his work over there and the work that continues over there, whether he's able to make it or not. And we pray, Father, for those precious souls that are in need of salvation. Father, we thank you for this good congregation here at Hamilton. We thank you, Father, for the work that it's done over the years and the work that it continues to do. We pray, Father, that you'll bless this congregation, its eldership, its leadership, deacons, preachers, teachers. Help them all, Father, to, to draw closer to you and to make decisions according to your will and according to your word. Pray for all of us that are here tonight that we can have attention for uh, the class that is being presented Thank you, Father, for Brother Ted and for um, the, the abilities that you've given him to open your word and, and present the truths of the gospel. Again, Father, we, we just thank you for all that you've given us, for all that you have blessed us with. And we just pray, Father, to help us not only through this night, but every night that you give us. It's in Jesus' name, humbly we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Will. We appreciate so much uh, your prayer. Thank you, Will, for your uh, leadership in the church. Will has uh, served several congregations as their uh, preacher, and uh, he and his family have done a lot of good work in the kingdom. Uh, this is week number three uh, in our study. We're studying from this uh, green book, His Family, which is our theme uh, for this year, and so we plan to spend the year in this book. And if you're watching at home and you don't have a copy, 
of this book. Uh, if you'll let us know, we'll be glad to get you one. I want to talk just a moment about the author of the lessons for week number three. I don't know how many of you know Justin Rogers. Uh, Justin is a good, good uh, man and a great Bible scholar. Uh, he uh, teaches at Fried Hardeman University. He's the director of the graduate program there. Um, he also uh, preaches for the Broad Street Church of Christ in Lexington, Tennessee. Um, I happened to be uh, in Tennessee last week, and I ran into Justin at a restaurant, and I told him, I said, Justin, I've already read your, your work on prophecies about the church, and you did a fantastic job, and I, I agree. Uh, he, he did a, a great job with this. It's a, a little more complicated than the first two, um, two. I thought Jeff and Dale did a great job with their chapters. Well, when you start talking about prophecies, it gets a little, uh, a little deeper. So let's start out on page 14 in the book and talk about uh, the Monday edition, which is uh, the eternal kingdom. And let's start out by reading Daniel chapter 2 and uh, verse 44 in the Bible. Uh, if you recall, Daniel has this dream. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and Daniel interpreted the dream. And uh, he saw this statue. But notice uh, particularly Daniel 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And Brother Rogers mentions on page 14 that Jesus fulfills over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. About the, and, and there are several prophecies in the Old Testament about the church. And this is one of them. Uh, Brother Rogers, in the second paragraph, says probably the best-known prophecy about the eternal nature of the church is Daniel 2 and verse 44 that we just read. And he describes, and we're going to look at a chart in just a moment that shows these kingdoms, but he describes these uh, kingdoms of men, and then he, he looks at the difference in the kingdoms of men and the kingdoms of God. Now, before we go any further, what's the main difference between the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God? What's the main difference? The kingdom of God is eternal. Yes, the kingdom of God is eternal. And every civilization of man, uh, every kingdom set up by man, eventually um, fades away. Think about the great empires of the past, like uh, uh, Alexander the... Uh, the great almost conquered the whole world and died in his 30s. Um, and then, you know, you have the Roman Empire. You have the uh, different empires. But all, all, all the th think about uh, empires uh, that we've known of, uh, uh, a lot of us in our lifetimes, that powerful leaders that now are either dead or nobody knows about them. Uh, Muminar Gaddafi, you know, was well known. Uh, what about Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden? They, they seemed to have this, these great kingdoms. Uh, in fact, Saddam Hussein lived in one of Nebuchadnezzar's palaces. Uh, and, but, you know, think about those great world leaders. Those were all temporary. But the thing about God's kingdom is it is eternal. Uh, so notice here, uh, I'm going to throw this chart up. I know it's difficult for you to probably see, uh, but uh, I, I want to, at least hopefully you can see that there's a statue there. And uh, this is a graphic that shows you the, the different realms. Uh, at the top, if you can notice the uh, realm one, uh, that's the... Uh, Head of gold, that stands for Babylon. 
Babylon was from 609 B.C. to 539 B.C. And if you remember, the children of Israel were carried away captive into Babylon. And so it's, it seemed like they would stand forever. But that kingdom, uh, of course, dissolved. And then in realm two, the, uh, the arms, the breastplate, and the arms, you'll notice that part is silver. Uh, that is the Medo-Persian uh, empire that conquered the Babylonian Empire, uh, it lasted from 539 B.C. to 331. Think about that. For it to stand for over 200 years, people probably thought that that kingdom would stand forever. Uh, but it was an earthly kingdom, and it, and it did not stand. And then notice the thighs of brass. Um, that is Greece. And uh, Greece was from 331 to 168 B.C. And then if you'll notice at the bottom, uh, the legs of iron were uh, from Rome. The Roman Empire from uh, 168 B.C. Um, and some would say, some historians would say it finally dissolved completely in 436 A.D. But all those are to show, uh, and then notice the feet of iron and clay was the uh, Roman Empire when it finally dissolved. But if you'll notice that rock at the bottom, uh, that symbolizes the, uh, the, the rock, the eternal kingdom, uh, which would never fade away. So what he's pointing out in this dream uh, if you look on page 14, notice that last paragraph. Traditionally, the Golden Kingdom is identified as the Babylonian Empire, the silver as the Medo-Persian Empire, the bronze as the Greek Empire, and the iron and clay as the Roman Empire. As powerful as all these great empires were, they were destined to fall. Yet God intends to establish an eternal kingdom. And that eternal kingdom, of course, uh, is the church. And in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, some have uh, erroneously thought that Peter was the rock upon which the church was built, but it was uh, the confession. Peter had just made a confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God a confession that we make before we become Christians and a confession that we continue to make each day of our lives. And so uh, if you are a, a member of the eternal kingdom, the church, then thank God. Before we go to the Tuesday edition, we, let's pause here and see uh, what comments we might have or questions or corrections that we need to make uh, about the Monday edition of Brother uh, Justin Rogers' uh, article on page 14. Any comments? Sir? Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Um, many believe that the Catholic Church was the original church. In fact, sometimes in their advertisements, if you'll notice on television, they'll say, we were the mother church. We were the original church. But that, that is not true uh, because uh, if you'll remember the old Jewel Miller uh, videos or Jewel Miller film strips, I thought it did a great job in explaining how uh, the church began to splinter away uh, from the early church and, and the Catholic church formed from that. So by, by 325, they were already having meetings and uh, creeds and uh, the Nicene Creed was... Uh, in 325, and so uh, they were not the original church, but they do claim to be that rock at the bottom. That's a good point. Any other comments? All right, let's move on to the uh, Tuesday um, comments there, and that's on page 15 in the textbook. And let's talk about then this from the book of Joel. And then where do we see these uh, words uh, repeated? 
uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 28. Where do, we, where do we see those words repeated? Yeah, Acts chapter 2. Um, Peter is going to repeat those on the day of Pentecost. And so it's very important uh, that, we, that we recognize. Uh, so he talks about the outpouring of the Spirit. Let's look at the top of page 15. It is God's way in Scripture to confirm His Word by miracles. Hebrews 2, 3 through 4 declare that the gospel is, uh, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. Therefore, the activity of the Spirit serves as a confirmation of the spoken word. And this is precisely what the Old Testament prophet Joel predicts in Joel 2, 28 through 32. In the next paragraph. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was manifested in a sudden and dramatic rush, enabling the apostles to speak in foreign tongues, Acts 2, 1 through 4, as the international gathering of Jews sought to sort out what they were witnessing, Peter instantly understood the relevance of Joel's prophecy. The course of the world turns on this prophecy, for Peter recognized a new period of history, the last days, a new people of God, all flesh, and a new plan for the world. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, this is a very important thing because uh, Peter, and of course he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He was speaking by inspiration. And he points out then that these are the last days and the very uh, things that, that, he was, uh, that Joel had prophesied. Now look at the third paragraph. I know that you can all read, and I'm not trying to insult your intelligence, but this is so good that I, I think we need to read it. Uh, the Spirit may not equip men and women of faith to perform miracles today, but the work of the Spirit is evident everywhere in the pages of Scripture. God has given us the Spirit, 1 John three twenty four and four thirteen, which indwells, 2 Timothy 1, 14, sanctifies us for obedience, 1 Peter 1, 2. This is a reality both prophesied, Joel 2, 28, and promised, Acts 2, 38, for God's people. While we may not understand everything about how the Spirit works in our lives, it's God's appointed agent to lead us, Romans 8, 13, 14, to help us, Romans 8, 26 through 27, and to empower us, Romans 15 and verse 13. And so uh, I don't understand... I like that song that says, I know not how the Spirit moves. I don't understand all about the Spirit. And, uh, but I do search for the Spirit's influence in my life. And, uh, and I try my best to glorify God by the way that I follow His Word and try to live it. Any comments about uh, the Tuesday edition on page 15 before we move on? Yes, yes. Um, I believe that. Yes, yes. That's right. That's um, a long name for that is premillennialism. The belief that Jesus will come back and set up a kingdom here on earth for a thousand years. Um, I think what they're doing is taking Revelation chapter 20 literally. Uh, a thousand years just means a long time. And uh, remember, uh, a, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It just means a long period of time. I personally believe we're living in that thousand years now. And uh, so I do believe that. But 
Now this is the, this is the thing about it. 70%, between 69 and 70% of the population of the world that call themselves Christians believe in what you just said. It is very predominant. But just because it's predominant does not mean it's true. It does. It does. The Bible... What, what, uh, no, what, what people have done is, um, a lot of that is from the book of Revelation, which is written in an apocalyptic language. There was only 300 years, 200 years before Christ came to earth, and 100 years after, that they used a special code language to keep the enemies of God's people from understanding it. The problem is, we're 2,000 years removed from it, and it's hard for us to understand the figurative language. And people have taken that literal. Um, I do not believe we will know when the Lord is coming, exactly when the Lord is coming. I think that's the reason we have to be prepared all the time. But, like other false teachings, that's been drilled into people so much that they believe that's what it is, even though uh, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not say anything about when Jesus comes again that he will step foot on the earth. Uh, what it says is that we will meet him in the air. The dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet him in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Um, I firmly believe this earth and the elements therein are going to be melted, burned up, and melted with a fervent heat. I had someone ask me, I said, where are you going to spend eternity? And I said, well, I, I, I'm a Christian. I plan to spend eternity with the Lord in heaven. He said, you'll be lucky to get there. So said, there's only, be, only going to be 144,000, he said. And I uh, said, you're, you're, you're not going to be one of them. I said, well, just out of curiosity, where do you plan to spend eternity? He said, well, I'm going to stay right here on earth. And I said, well, that's going to be really hard because it's going to be burned up and melted with a fervent heat. He said, oh, no, no, it's, it's not going to be. And what I found out is that he believes that Second Peter and Jude do not belong in the Bible. And so what he does is he rejects. See, if you reject... If you reject 2 Peter and you reject Jude, then you don't get the idea the earth is going to be burned up and melted with a fervent heat. So uh, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding out there. And uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know how to clear up that understanding, misunderstanding, except us just keep teaching the truth. Uh, any, any additional comments? Thank you, Dale. Any additional comments? Yes. That's a very real possibility, Michael. I appreciate that excellent comment and question. Um, I think that a lot of people take the book of Revelation out of context because that's what they've always been taught. And maybe uh, some people may think that they can live any way they'd like without accountability um, because they'll have time to repent during that thousand-year reign. Yeah. Yes. 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 At one time, 
According to Paul, I believe the gospel was carried to the whole world at that time. Um, I don't know that we'll be able, I hope that we can, but I don't know in our lifetimes that we'll be able to carry the gospel to the whole world. There are 74 nations right now. It's illegal to preach Jesus in those nations. Um, yes, sir, that prophecy has been fulfilled. I think there's a whole lot of uh, misunderstanding uh, about it. I don't claim to understand it all, but I do understand that a lot of uh, teaching has, false teaching has been done on the subject. Let's move to the Wednesday uh, edition, and that's on page 16. And to do, to do this, let's, let's talk about uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, verses 16 through 18, because uh, here is a prophecy about a New Testament temple. Uh, In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And of course, those are Old Testament prophecies uh, from Leviticus and Ezekiel and Isaiah, even some from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. So, In the Old Testament times, you could be stoned to death for defiling the temple. But the temple no longer stands in Jerusalem. It was destroyed in AD 70. And there are some of those people, like the ones you were talking about, Dale, who are trying to gather money to rebuild the temple because they think Jesus is going to reign in Jerusalem on the earthly throne of David. I believe what Paul is teaching here is that we are the temple. The church is the temple. Um, The people of God are the temple. It's not a a physical structure. Uh, God dwells in the hearts and in the minds of his people. And uh, so, um, you know, Brother Rogers says, um, you know, Uh, The temple in the Old Testament was the ground zero for God's presence. He dwelt in a tiny room called the Holy of Holies. Uh, And only one man from one tribe out of one nation on earth could enter his presence only on one day each year. And even then with all sorts of regulations. Leviticus 16. You know, and that's the high priest. Now what did he have to do to go into the Holy of Holies? He had to wash purify himself, offer sacrifices first for his own sins and then the sins of the people. And then he had to tie bells and pomegranates around the edges of his garment so when he went in, it made a noise or he'd be stricken dead. They tied a rope around him so if he died in there, they could drag him out. Otherwise, nobody could go in there after him. Those little pomegranates, pomegranates, uh, they were dried and the seeds inside would rattle. And if those bells and rattles didn't rattle, he was a goner. (laughs) I think, uh, Jeff, if I was the high priest, I'd been out there checking those things out before I entered (laughs) the most holy place because I'd surely hate to have been stricken dead. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, Uzzah, Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant, and you wasn't supposed to, but you know what, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was, was really small. It was about a fourth of the size of our Lord's Supper table. Look at that big Lord's Supper table. The Ark of the Covenant was just about a fourth of that size. And it was overlaid with gold, And just think about it, it was on a wagon, which, by the way, was a prohibition. 
God never approved for it to be carried on a wagon. He wanted it to be carried by the priest. But David thought he was doing the right thing, and he made a new cart. And that, when the oxen stumbled and that ark started to tumble, Uzzah did the same thing all of us would have done. I, I'm convinced we'd all reached up there and tried to keep that beautiful piece of furniture from falling off. And of course, he was stricken dead because uh, he did that which God had <coughs> forbidden. Aaron, yes, yes, uh, that's right. Aaron and uh, the tribe of Levi. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, now notice on page 8, uh, excuse me, 16, I want you to notice the last sentence in that uh, last two sentences in the first paragraph. In other words, God's presence was carefully guarded, but God has now chosen to dwell with his church, permitting his people to be the temple of his presence. Now, what kind of responsibilities does that put on us if we're the temple of God? Yeah. Keep your, your, keep your body, keep your life clean. Because if, if God dwells in us um, as a church, we have to do our very, very best to keep the church pure and to keep ourselves pure. And so it puts a big responsibility on us. When I was a young man, for just a short bit, I'm going to hand you the mic so that people online can hear if you don't mind. No, you're not talking too much. Okay, but from. Yes, so. But for the sake of uh, yeah, the scripture we're talking about now, when I was a young man, we were taught, or basically in my own heart and everything, that you shouldn't smoke, you couldn't drink, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink, or because that does defile the body. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 out of curiosity, how many of you were taught the same thing? I was. I was. If we're the temple of God, uh, aren't we supposed to not defile the temple of God? Um, so it puts a lot of responsibility, I think, upon the church. Um, so look at the last paragraph on uh, page 16. The intimacy of God's presence carries both riches and responsibility. Priests had to prepare themselves to enter God's presence by washing, donning linen clothing, and generally ensuring their ritual purity. No less must the new covenant people of God prepare to enter his presence. We must, as Isaiah declares, be separate, touch no unclean thing, keeping ourselves constantly unstained from the world, James 1, 27. This is because sin threatens God's presence. When we fail, he will flee our lives just as he fled the temple. Now, Just think about it. If God dwells in us, but we want to carry God into a place of uh, a questionable place? No. Um, I don't hear this very much anymore, but when I was uh, growing up, I used to hear people talk about, don't bring reproach upon the church. Any of you ever heard that term? Don't bring reproach upon the church. Um, I, I think that's the same concept here. That we, we do not need to do anything that would damage the reputation of God's people. And uh, Brother Rogers gives us a, a string of Old Testament prophecies and in, about the church. And Paul teaches that the church is God's temple. And so uh, I, I think this is a powerful lesson for us. That we're a, a new covenant people. Jeremiah 31 talked about a, a new covenant, and the law would be written in our hearts. And so I think we have a huge responsibility uh, to keep ourselves. Remember um, James 1 and verse uh, 27, 
Uh, we're to visit the widows and orphans in their affliction to keep oneself unspotted from the world, unstained from the world. So I can't live with one foot over here in the world and living go- uh, ungodly and then one foot over here uh, in, in the Lord and expect to, to please the Lord. I'm being lukewarm. And, and what, what, are we, what do we know about being lukewarm? How does the Lord feel about that? He will spew you out of his mouth. Well, let's look at Thursday. I've, I've talked too much. Uh, I, we're probably going to run out of time, but that's my fault. Notice uh, unique among the prophecies of the Old Testament is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Basically, uh, on Thursday, he talks about the new covenant. I'd like for us to have time to talk about the new covenant, but I spent too much talking. That's always been my problem. I just talk too much, and we just don't have time to finish it. But it's my fault. Now, next week, the Lord willing, we're going to start looking at some questions about the church. The first three chapters were introductory, and so we're going to look at those. Dale, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, would you mind uh, leading us in a closing prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Thank you for this time to worship. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray be with uh, J.L. Davis's family. Comfort them in their time of need, Lord. We pray for all of us that are, have COVID or have been sick, Lord. Comfort us in our time of need. Heal us according to thy will, Lord. Be with us uh, through the week, Lord. Keep us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, Lord. Keep us from sin. In Jesus Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Was that on the screen?